Off the Derech was a groundbreaking work by Faranak Margulies, studying the lives of people who were involved with Jewish observance and Jewish life and gave it up. And she did extensive interviews with these people to try to understand their backgrounds and really uh, what led to their break with Judaism. Interestingly, she found that only 2% of people who strayed from committed Jewish life did so because of issues concerning God. And actually, she found that 61% of people who stopped being observant still believed that God gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. But what she found, generally speaking, was that people were turned off by certain Jews that they met in their life, or by the system, or by the way they experienced Jewish living. Sadly, only 24% of the people that were interviewed found that their communities fostered spirituality. So there seemed to be something broken, not so much in the concept of God, but in their experience of Judaism for various reasons. And unfortunately, once the rupture with Judaism took place, then it didn't take a long time before their relationship with God to suffer as well. Now, it's interesting that Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz once pointed out that faith is not something normally that comes as a package that we receive nicely and neatly wrapped up and sealed and that stays that way forever and ever. Rabbi Steinzal says that in truth, doubt is actually part of the process of spiritual growth. It's normal, it's natural for people to go through doubt. And the truth is that our sages spoke to this question about what happens with people that just find it difficult or impossible to believe in God or are having difficulties believing in God. And so the Midrash in Eicha, the Midrash in Lamentations, has God saying the following. God says, Halavai, were it only so that they would abandon me, that the Jewish people would not believe in me, but at least they would observe my Torah. That's what God says in this Midrash. Would it only be that they would abandon me, but at least keep the Torah? And the Midrash goes on to say, because the light of the Torah will ultimately inspire them to return to me. But unfortunately, this can work the other way as well. Just like our bodies can become ill, our souls can become debilitated as well. And they can slip into a spiritual coma. People that go through a persistent neglect of Torah study, of Torah observance, of working on perfecting their character traits, and other spir spiritual pursuits, this can lead to an atrophying of their spiritual muscles and ultimately a weakening of their faith in God. There's a story that's told about the heady days of the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, about 200 years ago. And there were a number of Jewish students in Berlin who began having doubts. But before dropping Judaism altogether, they decided to send one of their group to the bastion of Torah in Valozhin to see if there might be any answers to their questions in that great citadel of Torah. So, one of the group went to Valozhin and he got completely immersed in the learning, in the studying of Torah. And when he returned to Berlin, he told his friends that he never experienced such intellectual and spiritual delight in his entire life. But they asked him, did you bring back any answers for our questions? And he says, no. But these questions no longer plague me. Now, this is not to say that there aren't reasonable responses 
to those questions that challenge people's faith. And tonight, we're going to look briefly at three different issues that often are raised and that come up when it comes to both people who challenge Torah faith and people who develop difficulties with their beliefs. One often heard challenge to Judaism is the disparity between the Torah's seeming harshness and brutality and our contemporary moral ethical values. For example, the Torah seems to prescribe capital punishment for a seemingly endless list of transgressions, such as violating the Sabbath. And so when people read the Torah, they're reading pages of, and if you do this, you'll be surely put to death. And if you do this, you're surely put to death. The truth is, and it's critical to understand, that the Torah, when we speak of Torah, it's not only what we read in the five books of Moses. That's only part of the Torah. There was much more Torah meaning there was much more teaching from God that was supposed to remain oral, passed down, transmitted orally, and not committed to writing. The oral Torah basically fills out and explains the general teachings that are recorded in the Bible. So, for example, when the Bible says, you shall bind them as a sign upon your arm and place them as totafot between your eyes, we would never know what that means. What does it mean to bind something as a sign upon your arm? What is the sign? And what in the world are totafot? The oral law explains precisely what that is. Or when the Bible speaks about the prohibition of doing melacha on the Sabbath. The Bible does not say that you can't work on the Sabbath. Even that, by the way, would be difficult to define. But the Bible proscribes milacha on the Sabbath. And this is a word that doesn't really have any easy access definition. There aren't any other times in the Bible where the word is used where we can understand what it means. So we wouldn't know what does it mean when the Bible says you can't do milacha on the Sabbath. What should we avoid? And so the oral law fills that out as well. And the truth is, as you go through the written text of the Bible, virtually nothing is self-explanatory. Now, the oral Torah revealed to us that it was virtually impossible to have a case where someone could be executed for violating the Sabbath. And that's because the rules of testimony in the Torah are extremely difficult to fulfill. First of all, in order to execute someone, there had to be two witnesses that warned the person in advance. Do you know that if you cook on the Sabbath, that can be a capital crime? And the person would have to say, I'm aware of that. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Then there had to be two witnesses that witnessed the person violating the Sabbath. And then the court would cross-examine each witness separately and would ask each witness very detailed questions about what they actually saw. When you saw this person cooking in his kitchen, what was the color of the wallpaper? And if the other witness didn't know exactly the same color, the testimony was thrown out. So the system of testimony itself for capital crimes was set up in such a way that it was virtually impossible to ever have a death penalty. And that's why the Talmud teaches that if a court executed someone in 70 years, it was a bloody court. And the reason is very easy to understand because the ethos of the Bible is that God is not interested in killing people that sin. The prophet Ezekiel spells this out in chapter 18, where God says, I'm not interested in the death of the wicked. Rather, that the wicked, the people that are doing the wrong thing, should turn from their sins 
and return to me, meaning that God's agenda ultimately is rehabilitation. And so the question is, if that's really God's intention, that people are not executed, but that they actually get a chance to repent, do tshuva, come back to God, stop doing what they shouldn't be doing. So why does the Torah keep on saying, you shall surely be put to death, you shall surely die? Why is there this disparity between what God ultimately desires and what the Bible actually says? And the reason is very simple. The Bible is trying to impress upon us how serious certain sins are. And if the Bible didn't say this, we might very easily think, well, it's not a big deal. But when we are told that this is a capital crime, meaning we deserve the death penalty, even though it may not be given, it impresses upon us how serious this mistake would be. There are similar concerns about the well-known principle of what we call lex talionis, an eye for an eye. Three times the Bible says that if you take out someone's eye, the penalty is that the court will take out your eye. And the Bible goes on to say that if you chop off someone's hand, your hand will be chopped off, etc. Now, our reaction to this should be threefold. Number one, we should feel that if a court is going to go and poke out, rip out the eye of a, an attacker, that's barbaric. To just picture a court officer being appointed to take out someone's eye is a barbaric thing. Number two, our reaction should be, that's not going to help the victim. What good is it to the victim if you just blind the attacker? doesn't help the person that was wounded. And number three, if you actually implement an eye for an eye, it's not really equitable. It's not really going to be fair ultimately. For example, let's imagine that the victim was an opera singer, but that the attacker was a pilot or a surgeon. So the opera singer can keep on singing with one eye. But if you take the pilot or the surgeon and you remove one of their eyes, they cannot function anymore in their profession. So it's not going to be equitable. Or it's a, a more drastic example. Let's imagine that the attacker already only had one eye. So a person that had an eye taken out, you can still see with one eye. If you try doing this, cover up one of your eyes, you can see plenty. It's not as good as having two eyes, but you can see plenty. But if the attacker only had one eye to begin with, and then they remove his remaining eye, he's totally blind. So we should say to ourselves, this doesn't make any sense. The Bible says an eye for an eye, it's barbaric, it doesn't help the victim, and it's not equitable. However, the oral Torah teaches us that this is not what we do. We don't poke out people's eyes. The oral Torah teaches us it's a Talmudic passage in Baba Kama that the penalty for hurting someone was actually the payment of five kinds of restitution. Number one, you would pay for the value of the limb that you damaged. The court would assess how much is an eye worth, how much is a finger worth, how much is an arm worth, how much is a leg worth. We do the same thing in our court systems today. The court will assess the value of a limb. Then the attacker has to pay for the pain they inflicted. They have to actually make restitution for the pain they caused the victim. They have to make restitution for the loss of wages. If this person was crippled and couldn't go to work for six months, they would have to pay that person's lost wages. Number four, they would have to pay the doctor bills. They'd have to pay for all the treatments of the person that was wounded. And finally, they would have to pay for the embarrassment. If this person is going to be embarrassed, having to wear an eye patch for the rest of their life, the attacker has to make compensation even for that embarrassment. That's the actual law. Now we have a big question. If the actual law is that you don't poke out people's eyes or rip off their arm, but you have to pay financial restitution. If that's the law, 
So why didn't the Torah say that? Why didn't the Torah say you have to write a check if you cut someone's arm off? Why does the Torah express it in a way that we don't do? We don't chop off arms or poke out eyes. We make the person pay money. So why didn't the Torah say that? And the answer is very simple. Because it would be crass to say, write a check if you poke out someone's eye. It wouldn't adequately convey the proper revulsion for the disgusting, loathsome act that the attacker did. By saying an eye for an eye, the Torah is expressing its revulsion, its disgust at what the attacker did. And the Torah is saying on some level, do you know what? To say to you, write a check for ripping out someone's eye, you're getting off easy. We're not conveying to you how disgusting and horrible your act was. By saying an eye for an eye, the Torah is telling you, do you know what? On some level, you deserve that that should happen to you. On a moral level, the Torah is expressing its disgust for what you've done. And the Torah says, that's what you deserve. It should happen to you. Your eye should be taken out. But it would be barbaric. It wouldn't help the victim. It would not be equitable. So basically, we have a Torah that is stereoscopic. We have a Torah where the written text and the oral Torah actually both serve an important purpose, and together they create the proper moral message, meaning the written text, which says an eye for an eye, is trying to convey moral indignation and revulsion at someone's disgusting behavior. The oral Torah tells you, practically speaking, however, what does the court do? And if we only had one and not the other, we wouldn't have both of these important lessons. Let's give two more examples of what people often raise as difficulties with the morality of the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, we have the laws of what is called an ir hanidachas, a city where the majority of people stray to worship idols. And the Bible says that the entire city must be destroyed and all of their possessions burnt. Now that seems very cruel, meaning that if it's only a majority of people who are worshiping idols, everyone is killed, even the minority who are not worshiping idols. And we are revulsed by that. We say, what is going on here? So how do we square this idea of destroying a city where the majority of people are worshiping idols? How do we square this with what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17, which speaks about the Torah and says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all of her paths are peace. So how do we reconcile this? So the Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin 71a teaches that this law of Ir Hanidachas is only theoretical. It never happened, and it never will happen. Why is that? The text of Deuteronomy tells us that the ir hanidachas has to be entirely burnt. All of the possessions burnt. The problem is that if the city contained even one mezuzah, even one scroll of scripture that on the doorpost of a house or on someone's room, then burning the city would be destroying God's name, which is forbidden. And so the Talmud says that because it is impossible to imagine that there's going to be a city where there isn't even one mezuzah in the city, especially when the Torah promises us that the Torah is never going to be forgotten in Israel entirely. So the, Torah, the Talmud teaches us that since there's never going to be a time, a place, 
where an entire city won't have even one mezuzah. So therefore, it's not allowed to destroy an ir hanidachas, such a city. So again, if there's never going to be a situation where an ir hanidachas is going to be destroyed, why does the Torah contain such a passage? It would seem that it's there as a deterrent to ensure that no city will allow itself to stray so far so that not even one mezuzah is going to be found in the city. And it also impresses upon the neighboring cities that they have a responsibility to watch over their brethren to make sure that the spiritual situation elsewhere does not deteriorate till they hit rock bottom. So what appears to be on the surface a harshly brutal call to violence is at its core a call for spiritual responsibility and care and concern for others. One last example. Many critics of the Torah claim that God commanded mass genocide upon the inhabitants of Canaan when the Israelites were to enter the land 40 years after leaving Egypt under the command of Joshua. This is found at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 7. This, however, was not the case. There was no moral and mortal hostility to the people of the seven nations inhabiting Canaan itself. There was no war of genocide against those people. The issue was the abominable moral and spiritual ways that were, that were steeped into these cultures, ways of idolatry, child sacrifice, oppression of the weak by the powerful, grotesque sexual practices. That was the problem with these nations. Maimonides, in his Laws of Kings, chapter 6, explains, and he bases this upon Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10, which spells out that when the Israelites came into the land, they didn't just immediately wage a war of genocide to wipe out all the people. They first had to offer the people, the inhabitants of the land, opportunities to make peace. That was the first move. And the Jerusalem Talmud tells us that before Joshua came into the land, he sent three letters to the people asking them if they were willing to make peace. And they had to be willing to basically follow the universal laws of morality of the seven laws of Noah. The seven laws of Noah are basically very minimalist requirements. No murder, no adultery, no idolatry. But they had to agree to live by these laws, or they could have agreed to just leave the country altogether. And if they refused these conditions... So then the Israelites were commanded to wage war against the adult males, but there was no mandate and was actually prohibited to harm the women or the children. But they were required to go to war against anyone that not willing to make peace terms with them. And God's concern was that otherwise, these corrupt people would have a very negative impact and influence upon the people of Israel. In fact, that is exactly what happened. We know from the book of Joshua that the Israelites never fully conquered the peoples of Canaan. They were living there amongst the Israelites. And that's exactly what happened. They did corrupt the Jewish people who began to imitate their abominable idolatrous practices. Now one final point should be mentioned on this topic. Critics of the Torah and critics of God tried to frame its teachings as horrifically violent, barbarically brutal, and vile. This is what you're going to hear from critics of the Torah. The Torah is the most barbaric, cruel, harsh, disgusting set of laws and teachings that you could find. Now, if this, in fact, was the case, what has been the impact of the Torah upon the people who have dedicated themselves to living by its teachings for the past 3,300 years.
if in fact the Torah is essentially a vile, brutal book of horrific violence, so what has been the impact of this horrible, horrific, violent, brutal book upon the Jewish people? Have we become violent, vicious, cruel people? Has that been what the effect of the Torah has been upon the Jewish people? Or has the teachings of the Torah produced a very different kind of people? A people who are known universally as people dedicated to peace, to kindness, to caring, to generosity, and to charity. I would say, regarding the Torah, the proof is in the pudding. If we want to understand what is the real message of the Torah, look at its impact upon the people who have observed the Torah for the past 3,300 years. The second area that I'd like to touch on tonight is the alleged conflict between science and religion in general. Last year, a friend of mine pressed me to read a book, a new book, by Dan Brown of the Da Vinci Code fame. And in his book, Origin, Brown makes a very bold claim through a fictional adaptation of a real-life MIT professor of physics named Jeremy England. So if you read Origin, it speaks about this professor of physics from MIT named Jeremy England. And in the book, England claims to have discovered a principle behind the origin and evolution of life that would make God obsolete. And that's really the thrust of this book by Dan Brown. The whole uh, theme and the whole uh, concept behind the book is there's some a uh, billionaire media mogul who's got an in for religion and he does a lot of research and he's going to reveal his proof that God does not exist. And his proof is based upon the research of Jeremy England. Now, after reading Brown's book, I found an article in the Wall Street Journal written by the actual, the real Jeremy England. The title of the article was, Dan Brown Can't Cite Me to Disprove God. Dr. England is actually an Orthodox Jew. He's at the forefront of research into the origins of life. And not only does he believe in God, but he believes that God is behind the physical processes that he observes in the laboratory. Stephen Jay Gould was an American evolutionary biologist, paleontologist, and a historian of science who spent most of his career teaching at Harvard University. In an article appearing appearing in Scientific American in 1992, Gould, who was an atheist, wrote the following, that the natural sciences, including evolutionary theory, were consistent with both atheism and conventional religious belief. Gould believed that the frontiers of modern science cannot prove God, but they cannot disprove God. And indeed, the very same universe that inspires atheists to believe in chance, in randomness, and the laws of nature moves other people to recognize the creator. It's the same exact universe. Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs wrote a profound book dealing with science and religion called The Great Partnership. And Sachs asserts that where science takes things apart to see how they work, religion puts things together to see what they mean. And he insists that both together, both science and religion together, constitute a full legitimate expression of our humanity. So what might account for the tendency to split these apart? Why is it that some people see a mortal battle between science and religion? So Sachs presents some very fascinating clues. 
He shows that alphabets in our world that don't have letters functioning as vowels, right, such as Hebrew and Arabic. Hebrew doesn't have letters that function as vowels. In Hebrew, the letters are all consonants. So alphabets that don't have letters that function as vowels, these alphabets are read from right to left. Interesting. And alphabets with letters that are vowels, like English, French, or Spanish, these alphabets are read from left to right. Now, why might that be significant? So in languages with letters that are vowels, like English's A-E-I-O-U, there is little ambiguity about how to read the words. When you read a word in English, it's not that difficult to pronounce the word. But with Hebrew, there are no vowels in Hebrew. It's not so easy to know from the letters themselves, from the consonants themselves, what the word is and what it means. You can only figure it out from the context. So reading Hebrew requires a bit of mental activity and judgment. Sachs goes on to explain that language processing skills are associated with different parts of the brain. The left hemisphere of our brain tends to be linear, sequential, and mechanical. The left hemisphere of the brain tends to break things down into their component parts and deals with them sequentially. The right brain tends to be integrative and holistic. While the left brain is attentive to details, the right brain gets an overview and sees things as a whole. The right hemisphere is strong on empathy and emotion. It reads situations and moods. This is where our social intelligence is situated in the right brain. The right brain understands subtlety, nuance, ambiguity, irony, and metaphor. The right brain lives with complexities that the left brain tries to resolve by breaking them down into their component parts. So Rabbi Sachs explains that languages with vowels, where words can be understood one by one, are processed by the left brain. And they are read from left to right, moving the eyes and the head to the right while engaging the left brain. And languages without vowels, like Hebrew, requiring context, understanding, and the integrative functions of the right brain. So we read them because it requires the right brain to engage these languages without vowels. We read them from right to left, moving our eyes and head towards the left and thereby engaging the right brain. Now it's fascinating that ancient Greece was the foundation of what would become the scientific and philosophical culture of the Western world. The Greek alphabet became a left-to-right alphabet, and they became history's greatest left-brain civilization. But the cognitive style of the Jews was and is very different. Our alphabet goes in the opposite direction, opposite from the Greeks. We go from right to left. And we have a strongly right-brained culture. As a result, we tend to value different things than the Greeks valued. Greeks worshipped human reason. Jews emphasized divine revelation. Greeks gave the world philosophy and science. The Jews gave the world religious faith. 
And Rabbi Sachs persuasively argues in his book that when it comes to science and religion, it's not either or. We have two eyes, so we can see stereoscopically. And our brain has two hemispheres, and we need them both. Ultimately, science and faith should function together and enhance each other. But that's not our current situation. There is no marriage today between the East and the West. We don't have this harmony between the Greek left brain culture and the Judaic right brain culture. Our Western culture is essentially derived from the Greek. And so there is this tendency to be sticking to one or the other. And science, therefore, tends to see itself as a separate, distinct body and discipline than faith. Now, there's a range of ways in which Jewish thinkers have understood the interface between Torah and science. A number of different ways in which our thinkers have tried to process this interface. One approach is explored in great detail by Rabbi Dr. Moshe Meiselman in his work, Torah, Chazal, and Science, written in 2013. And his view, which is shared by others, such as the Lubavitcher Rebbe, is that in general, modern science is transitory and provisional. The Torah, however, is absolutely true and divinely inspired. And therefore, by definition, this perspective rejects the need to accommodate religion to science. This view tends to be very skeptical about the absolute truth of science and tends to feel that scientists are still working at trying to get to the truth. And therefore, they prioritize, this particular approach prioritizes the truth of Torah and they hope that one day science will catch up. However, Maimonides, writing in the 13th century in his Guide to the Perplexed, takes the opposite point of view. In his day, the entire scientific community had accepted Aristotle's assertion, Aristotle from the 4th century BCE, that he said that the world was eternal. So by the time of Maimonides, the entire world believed in the eternality of the universe. And Maimonides wrote, the Rambam, another way of saying Maimonides, the Rambam wrote that if he were convinced that Aristotle was proven definitively correct, if it was shown to him that Aristotle's idea was proven to be definitively correct, he would have to reinterpret Genesis chapter 1, the creation story, in such a way that it would be congruent with scientific fact. That was what Maimonides said. Maimonides said there cannot be a contradiction between Torah and science, and if there is, and science is proven to be correct, we've got to adapt the Torah in a sense of understanding the Torah to somehow mesh with the science. But... Maimonides was not thoroughly convinced that Aristotle was 100% correct. Even though everybody accepted Aristotle, Maimonides was not thoroughly convinced. And therefore, he didn't reinterpret the creation story to fit in with Aristotle. And the truth is that faithful Jews, since the time of Aristotle, stuck to the traditional understanding of Genesis chapter 1, despite overwhelming consensus from scientists until the mid-1960s when the Big Bang was finally discovered and then science changed its tune and said, we have to admit now that the world has not been here forever. The world did come into existence at some point. Now Maimonides' son, the Rambam's son, Rabbi Abraham, taught that the Talmudic sages sometimes relied on the scientific assumptions of their age. 
the son of the Maimonides says that the rabbis of the Talmud, they would basically go with the best science of the days they were living in, which was sometimes flawed. And a number of great rabbis concurred with this view, that the sages of the Talmud were not a thousand percent correct all the time because they would sometimes go with the current science. But the majority of Jewish sages have tended not to accept this view of the, of the son of Maimonides. But it's certainly a legitimate view within Jewish thinking. A third approach uh, to dis in discussing the interface between science and faith is that of Rabbi Natan Slifkin in his book, The Challenge of Creation. And he argues that the Torah and science don't really interface and that they are dealing with totally different subject matter. Slifin maintains that the Torah isn't a science book, and it's not interested, and it doesn't teach us scientific verities, scientific ideas. Rather, he says, the Torah is a spiritual guidebook of eternal values and teachings on how to conduct our lives. So he does not get excited when he sees statements in the Torah that don't seem to line up with Science. He says these are two totally different systems. A fourth approach is one that's taken by a number of contemporary Orthodox Jewish scientists, such as Dr. Gerald Schroeder and Dr. Natan Aviezer, and they hold, interestingly, that Torah and modern science can be totally reconciled without violating the integrity of either discipline. For example, the Torah seems to teach that the world was created in six days, 6,000 years ago. While modern scientists believe that the universe is about 14 billion years old. So some Jewish scientists resolve this apparent contradiction by arguing that the six days of creation should not be understood as literal 24-hour days for two reasons. Number one, we know that sometimes the word day in the Bible means not a 24-hour period of time, but an era or an epoch. For example, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 23, referring to the Messianic age, the prophet speaks about it as Yom Hashem, the day of the Lord. Or in our prayers, we say every day from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, by Yom Hahu. On that day, God will be one and his name will be one. It's not talking about only on a 24-hour period of time. It's speaking about the messianic age when in that age, everyone is going to come to know God. So number one, we see that the word day in the scriptures don't always mean 24 hours. Furthermore, according to the first chapter of Genesis, the sun was only created on the fourth day. Now, the first three days, therefore, it's hard to imagine that they were 24 hours because our definition of a 24-hour day depends upon the relationship between the earth and the sun. So it's quite possible that the first three days could have been much, much longer periods of time than 24 hours. Now, the final issue that I wanted to touch upon tonight is the problem of evil and suffering. Philosophers refer to this as theodicy, God's justice. Specifically, why do bad things happen to good people? This is one of the thorniest problems that people of faith have. I often tell a story that when I was living in New York, I was giving a lecture about keeping kosher. And in the middle of the talk, a woman comes in off the street and she gets up in front of our class and she announces to everyone, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. So I asked her, why is it that you don't believe in God? And she said, because of the Holocaust, after the slaughter of six million Jews, I don't believe in God. So I said to her, you'll excuse me, but I think you really do believe in God. 
And she got very upset with me. And she said, I just told you I don't believe in God. What are you talking about? I said to her, well, it seems to me that because of the Holocaust, you're very, very angry at God. And she said, angry, I'm furious at him. So I said, well, I guess you do believe in God. Right? It's impossible to be furious with someone that you don't believe exists. So it's very important to understand this point. It's not a minor point. The entire problem of theodicy, the entire problem of suffering and evil in the world is only a problem. It only becomes a problem if you believe that there is an all-powerful, benevolent God that runs the world. Because then, any time righteous people suffer, it doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem just. But if our world does not have an ultimate, benevolent, all-powerful being that runs it, and our world is just random, and everything here is an accident, then what is there to appeal to? Why would we think in such a world that things should go differently? Why would we think that in a world of randomness, righteous people shouldn't suffer? And I would suggest, actually, that if we are truly bothered by evil in the world, if we're really bothered by it, it sort of indicates that deep down inside, we really do believe in God. Because we believe there's a power that could make things otherwise. And that's exactly what bothers us. We believe that there's a God that can make things otherwise, and why isn't he? And that's my problem with suffering and evil. But it's important to remember that this problem only exists if there is a God. Now the truth is that if you go through Jewish literature, the bottom line response to the question of evil is very simple. The bottom line response is that human beings are simply not capable of understanding how God does anything, let alone how God manages and runs the world. God says to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 55, My thoughts are not like your thoughts. And the entire book of Eov, the entire book of Job, is a book that focuses on this question of how is it possible for a righteous person like Job to be suffering so terribly. And Job's friends have all these ways of explaining it. They basically say, look, if you're suffering, it must be because you sinned. You must be punished for some good reason. And Job maintains his innocence. No, I did not sin. I'm a righteous person. I'm okay. And at the end of the whole book, they're arguing for chapters and chapters and chapters. God finally makes his appearance and basically says to Job's friends, you guys don't understand anything. He challenges them and he basically asks a long list of questions. He says, where were you when I called for forth the morning? Where were you when I created the world? What do you know about creating a world? He, he, God basically says that you're trying to understand how I run the world. Uh, this is how I would write the book of Job. Mm -hmm. If you have a pet, for example, you have a, a cat that you adore, and you happen to love Beethoven, do you think you can actually explain to your cat why you love Beethoven? The truth is that your cat is not capable of understanding your thought processes. And in the same way, what God says to us is, you're a human being, you are finite, you are physical. I am an ultimate spiritual transcendent being. There's no way you can understand me. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. The medieval Jewish philosophers would say, Luyadativ hayitiv. If you knew God, you would be God. But we're not. And this, the rabbis tell us, is exactly what Moses was challenging God. Moses says to God, show me your ways. Show me your glory. And the question is, what was Moses asking? 
And the rabbis teach us that Moses was asking this question. God, how is it that righteous people suffer? I don't get it, Moses says. And God says to him, man cannot see me and live. God's not saying that you can't see God you know, physically, because God's not physical. God doesn't have a body. God is using the word see me as in understand me. Like, I see what you mean. That's what happens with Adam and Eve. They opened their eyes and they saw they were naked. What do you mean they saw they were naked? They've always seen that they were naked. They weren't wearing clothing. It means now they understood they were naked. So God says, you want to understand how I run and manage the world? Man, not just you, Moses. No human being can see me, can understand me. Why? Because you're a living, mortal, physical human being. That's step one to appreciate. We just cannot understand anything about God. Number two, we have to be honest with ourselves and acknowledge that, and Maimonides says this, a lot of suffering in this world is self-inflicted. A lot of evil in this world is man-made. A lot of our illnesses are caused by poor diet, by environmental problems. We could be much healthier as people than we are. There's tremendous moral depravity in the world. Kids are bullied in school. People are inflicting physical harm against others. It's rampant in our world. But would we rather live in a world where God would prevent every unjust act? When we're honest with ourselves. Would I rather live in a world where every time someone approaches me for money on the street, God would force me to put my hand in my pocket and give this person money? Would I prefer to live in a world where every time someone was going to say something cruel to someone else, God would make them mute? Would I rather live in a world where God prevented every inappropriate action by a human being? And I would say none of us would want to live in a world like that because we wouldn't be human. We wouldn't have free will. And so one of the price tags of being human is that we live in a world of free will where people will abuse that free will. That's the second thing to consider. A third thing to consider is that we don't see the big picture when it comes to what our lives really are all about. We look at a human life and what do we see? We see 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 120 years and we assume, look at all the suffering this person had. It doesn't seem right. What are we looking at though? Our tradition teaches us that if you're here now, there's a good chance that you were here before. We believe in reincarnation. And it could be that if a person is suffering now and they look like a very sweet person, we don't know what they did in a previous life. Maybe there was a need for them to go through some kind of suffering now, not because of the life they're living now, but because of a previous life. Or when we try to put a, a person's life into perspective and we think about how good has God been to this person, so again, we see the tip of the iceberg, but we believe in an afterlife that is not going to be a hundred years or a thousand years. We believe in an eternal afterlife. So we don't see the big picture, the full picture, when it comes to evaluating the quality of people's lives. I want to share one final thought. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs shared a story about Rabbi Yakusiel Halberstam, who was the Kloisenberger Rebbe. Rabbi Halberstam went through the Holocaust. He was at a number of concentration camps, including Auschwitz. During the war, he lost not just his wife, but all 11 of his children. And he made a pledge to God that if he would survive, he would dedicate himself to helping alleviate suffering and saving lives. That was his pledge he made. And indeed, the Kloisenberger Rebbe did survive the Holocaust, and he ultimately moved 
with his followers to the land of Israel, settling in Netanya, and he built Laniado Hospital, a place dedicated to helping alleviate suffering for everyone, for Jews, for Christians, for Arabs. It's an incredible institution. And someone once asked the Kloisenberger Rebbe, don't you have any questions for God? After everything that you've been through, don't you have any questions for God? And the Rebbe said, of course I do. I have some incredibly difficult, deep questions that I could ask God. Believe me. And I'm sure that if I were to ask God these questions, he would invite me up to heaven and give me the answers. But the Rebbe said, but I prefer being down here with the questions than being up there with the answers. And Rabbi Sachs explained the profound nature of this answer. He said that if we had an answer to the question of why bad things happen to good people, we had an answer, we'd be reconciled with why bad things happen to good people. We would make peace with it. But the truth is that we have the question. We have the question of why righteous people suffer. And we don't have an answer. We don't even try to answer it because we don't want to become reconciled to why bad things happen to good people. And because we're not reconciled to it, we fight so that bad things won't continue to happen to good people. We don't seek to be reconciled with human suffering and to make peace with it and to understand it. There's a certain cruelty to understanding suffering. If I was to understand exactly why that person's going through what they're going through, there's a certain level of cruelty there. Oh, now I understand why that person's going through that. And for me to emotionally make peace with it and feel I understand it would be a tragedy. So we don't strive to understand why people suffer. We strive to make this world a place where suffering is prevented and suffering is alleviated.